easily flip over and catch hold. And the stiffness of that coating makes it brilliant as what we call a combi link, a combination of materials, but it also makes it very difficult to tie. And that's the thing that people have problems with. They tie knots in it, they don't tighten the knot down properly, and then when you get a bite, the knot tightens by the fish and it cuts through the hook link and you end up losing the fish. And there is an easy way to get around that. Now if I show you the first hook link, this is my preferred way of doing it. Okay, it's a very short hook link you'll notice to start off with. And what I've done on this, I've used the new stripper tool to strip away the coating because it is on there pretty tough. So by using the stripper tool, it will come off in seconds and you don't fray the braid either. And those stripper tools are really good. Any coated hook link you've got, they'll take the coating off brilliantly. So I strip a little bit away and then I do my own special knot for tying the hook on, which is like a whipping knot. Basically form a big loop underneath the hook and then wrap that loop around the hook, first of all going up the hook and then keep wrapping but going down the hook. And then there's a little tag end at the front of the hook that you pull tight and that tightens it all down. It's the same knot that you use for whipping eyes on rods. So once that's tied on, I tie on a little tiny micro rig ring. Tiny little one, I don't want it sliding around on the hook too much. And that serves two purposes. First of all, it allows the hair to come off the hook quite a long way up, close to the bend of the hook, which with a bottom bait like I'm using now, this is one of the mainline dumbbells, it makes the point of the hook really heavy. So the hook flips over and catches hold brilliantly. And the second reason is that that ring will slide out of the way as the hook penetrates, so there's nothing to stop the hook going in as far as possible. It's not for anti-ejection, I don't believe that works at all. And then down from that, you've got a little tiny bit of shrink tube. We've noticed from the underwater filming that too much shrink tube can actually get in the way of the hook catching hold. So I've got a lot less shrink tube on there. It's the new coloured shrink tube that's coming out in all the safe zone colours and that should be available by the time this film actually gets into the tackle shops. A little tiny bit and you see there, it's just taking the same sort of curve as the intern of the eye. I used to curve it in more aggressively than that but having it almost straight like that actually makes the hook flip over and catch hold quicker. And then we've got the little bit of soft braid exposed and then the coated section. And you'll see at the other end what I've done in this instance is I've actually crimped a link loop onto it. It's a Witchwood carp crimp and you need a special crimping tool that Witchwood do as well. And the reason I've started doing that is it's so much easier to do than tying a knot and you can get the hook link exactly the right length. So all you do is feed the, the, the crimps are a double barrel crimp, so all you do is feed through one barrel, round through the link loop, through the other barrel, pull it up really tight so the two are really really close together and then using the crimping tool you just squeeze it down and it's done. And if you pull that, that's actually stronger than any knot you can do because there's no knot there. Okay, now before I started doing that, I used to use a figure of eight loop knot. So I'll show you that now. That's that one. Now this hybrid is rated at 20 pounds breaking strain. And the reason for that is if you tie a figure of eight loop knot like that and do it properly, you'll get at least 20 pounds out of it. Now the, the actual material itself with no knots in it is 45 pounds breaking strain. So people say to me, oh, I've snapped it in the middle. Absolute rubbish, it's just not possible to do that. What's happened is they've tied a loop knot, they haven't tightened it down properly, and then it's snapped at the loop knot. That's what's happened. And the, all you have to do, you tie your simple figure of eight loop, so I make a big loop, twist one towards you, pull your baiting needle, so you pull one loop through the other, and pull it up tight. And that's where most people leave it, and that's what they're doing wrong. What you then do is hold it over a steaming kettle just to warm that plastic coating up because if you make plastic hot, it goes softer. So you put it over the kettle, keep the tag end on it, and then take it out of the steam, and then pull it really, really tight. And what you'll see happen, you'll see the knot close down on itself. And that means that it's as tight as possible and it's not gonna move at all. And if you do that, you'll get 20 pounds breaking strain out of that figure of eight loop knot. And then another option is, this is a knot showed to me by my very good friend Co from Holland. Um, I think it's a Cub Scout knot or something. That's really, really easy to tie. It's literally a simple overhand knot, pull it tight against the little tiny metal bar, and then do a second overhand knot, pull that tight, but only sort of finger tight, not really, really tight. And then you hold the bar in between your hands and pull the hook link, and it just slips just a tiny amount and locks down, and that's locked in place. And that's extremely strong as well, that knot. Really, really easy to tie, no need to steam it and very, very strong. And then the last way of doing it is to tie the knot that you would normally tie in your mono just to the eye of that link loop. 
Those link loops are really good. They're a teardrop shaped metal loop and it's like having a loop on the end of the hook link, but obviously it's much harder wearing. Now there, I've used a four turn half blood knot and I've pulled it down as tight as I possibly can and then held it over the steam and then taken it back into my body and pulled it really tight and you can see all the, all the loops on that knot are all down close together. There's no way that knot can move and that, believe it or not, is probably gonna give you 25 pounds breaking strain. The loop knot is the weakest one of the lot. We rate that at 20 pounds. If you do that or a grinner, tie the knot and get it as tight as you possibly can and then put it over the steam and then pull it even tighter it will shrink down even more and you'll get absolutely no problems with it now if you're going to use hybrid all the way up to that link loop or tie a little loop in it so there's going to be no break in it whatsoever it's best suited to hard gravel bottoms or sandy bottoms so that it'll all lie nice and flat on the bottom now if the lead starts to penetrate into the bottom then the hybrid can give you problems because the hook link is in the bottom the baits on the end and it's sort of doing that out of the bottom. So what makes it brilliant on hard gravel bottoms actually works against you if it's weedy or silty. But there is a way around that. I'll show you this next one. Now this, believe it or not, is also the hybrid. Exactly the same colour, but what I've done with this is I've got a black or a dark brown marker pen and I've just flecked it down it and smudged that marker pen all up and down it so it suits more silty bottoms or more weedy bottoms. The most important thing at the end there, there's a break. So what I've done is I've stripped the coating away at the other end and I've tied a simple grinner knot in the inner braid onto that link loop. So basically what can happen, if I hold it like that, you imagine the lead's attached to this bit here, all of that has gone into the soft bottom or into the weed and that st stiff bit is lying flat along the bottom and I've actually added a little tiny bit of putty there, that's Gardner Critical Mass Putty to the hook link just to hold it down flat. And because this has got a fluorocarbon coating to it, it's very heavy anyway. So it won't loop up off the bottom. If it's on a nice flat bottom, it will lie flat. But sometimes I add a little bit of extra putty just to be 100% because with all the underwater films we've made, we've seen that the closer everything is to the lake bed, the more bites you're gonna get. So that's the hook link side of it. What I'm gonna talk you through now is my lead system. So that's basically it. Lead clip system but with a twist. Again, from the underwater filming, I've seen that fish have been able to get away with a semi-fixed lead, literally by shaking their head, and they're actually shaking the hook out of their mouth. And that caused me to use a lot more running rigs. And that's effectively what that is, because what I've done on the end there, is I've cut off the ring swivel that goes on the end of the, comes on the end of the safe zone leader as standard. I've cut that off, and then I've just replaced it with a quick link. And then what I've done is I've squeezed the lead clip just a little bit, so when I pull that in, that's just in there under the tiniest amount of tension. Bomb, that's out really, really quickly. So it's turned the rig from a semi-fixed rig into a running rig instantly. So as soon as the fish picks the rig up, realises something's wrong, shakes its head, that lead is then sliding away from the fish. And that makes it much harder for them to get rid of the hook. And then further down the leader there, I've put a little four mil rubber bead and that just gives it a bit of a jolt as the fish moves off. And the other thing it stops happening is the lead coming off the end of the leader and then ending up on top of the leader. So when you're playing the fish, you've got the whole leader like that with the lead on the top there. Having that bead on basically, let me shake that down, stops it going past that point on the bite. It will still pull off if the line gets broken in during the fight and the fish is dragging the lead around, it will pull off because that bead during the fight is normally moved up to that sort of point there during the fight. So it does actually move, but it just stops the lead coming off the end of the leader when you get a take. If you don't actually use that bead, every time you get a fish in, the lead will be off the end of the leader. And it's just funny to play a fish on. So just to show you how to attach the hook link, I'm gonna use the shortest one, which is the one that's got the bait on as well. It's the one I've crimped, and literally the link loop just attaches on like that. And then if I pull it inside the lead, you see there, there's no way that that hook link can get back out off that quick link there because the join or the little arm that comes out is just inside the lead clip, just enough. And then when you get a bite, boom, that's pulling out straight away. And what I would do is finish that off with a little tiny long chuck stick and I'll have one of these dumbbells on the end with my favorite tuna mix, or if I'm fishing a tiger nut, I'll have my favorite nut mix on the end as well. The only situation I wouldn't use this rig in is if it's weedy or snaggy. 
then you need the lead clip to work as it was originally intended and actually eject the lead if it gets snagged up in something and that won't happen with this rig as soon as that's pulled out of there the rig turns into a running rig and there's no way that lead can get off the lead clip so when it's clear bottom and there's not much for the fish to get caught up in I'd use that rig and I think it'll get you more bites but if it's weedy or snaggy use a lead clip as it was originally intended and we are going to show you how to do that exactly right because it's another thing that loads of people get wrong well in all this freakish weather we have just had the mother of all hailstorms it's like someone's tipped about 200 gallons of slush puppy over me bivy I know I've got hands, I just can't actually feel them at the moment. And attached on the end here is a Mohusif carp. This is without doubt the biggest one I've hooked. It's just tried to take me around the little island on the right hand side and it's kited back out into open water only because there's not enough depth of water, I think, for it to go around the island. Um, I haven't got a clue where it is at the moment. And it is massive. Okay, baby. Got him! Come on! What a beast in horrendous weather. Right, I'll lift it. You read it, boys. Yeah. Two bets. Oh, it feels heavy. Oh, it's a bit higher, mate. Come on. 56. I'd go 52.8. Right, 52.8. 52, 52, 52, 52, 52, 52. Excellent. <laughs> How about that? Oh. Four times I've been to Maison and four times I've had a 50. What a result. Right. We have just had the freakiest storm ever hailstones, oh, the size of conkers, oh, and this beast, he went off just after it, 52.8. What a result in really, really difficult spring conditions that feels more like Siberia. What a beast. Oh, felt big all the way in, oh, rain lashing down. My hands were nearly falling off. They were so cold. Oh, and this was the prize at the end of it. Proper result. Oh. And how about that for a bit of proof that that lead clip system that I adjust a little bit works and the safe zone leaders and the hybrid too. 52 and a half pounds of massive Maison mirror. What a beast. Before this product came out, I swore that I would never use it, but since it's come out, I have to admit I've used them more and more. It's called an extender stop, and I'll show you the first rig there. That was tied for two bits of plastic corn. My 12 mil pop-up is ever so slightly bigger, so it won't fit on the hair, and by using the smallest size of extender stop, I've just lengthened the hair ever so slightly, and the rig's perfect again. And then going on to the next one, we all do it. You tie the hair too short and then the bait's too close to the hook. And what I've done here is just use an extender stop just to pull that bait a little bit further away from the hook. And you can do that if you've tied up a hair for a 14 mil bait and you want to go over to an 18 mil bait, rather than tying a new rig, just use the medium size extender stop and it takes the bait far enough away from the hook again. They're also really good for pellets. We didn't design them that way, but because they pull up inside the pellet, when the pellet goes soft, they stay on for longer because they're actually inside the pellet. We've all experienced the hair stop falling out because the pellet's gone soft. Not so with these. And they're also really good for luncheon meat or any soft bait at all. They stop the hair pulling through the bait, which means you can cast them further. And finally, they're really good at stopping the craze getting the bait off the hair. That's their little trick. They pull the hair stop off, pull the bait off the hair, and you wind in the morning and you've got no bait. Because these pull up inside the bait, the craze have got to eat the bait down to where the hair stop finishes, and then they can pull it off. And I've actually wound in half a bait in the morning, which could have got me a bite, which wouldn't have been on there if I'd been using a normal hair stop. There are three sizes of extender stop and a normal hair stop, and I have to admit it, they're in my box all the time because you never know when you're going to need them. 
Damien Clark back in the office would absolutely kill me if I didn't show you this. He spent ages getting this exactly right. I don't know if you remember the old Stuart float boxes, the long thin boxes, pretty much shaped like this. That's what Damien used to keep all his rigs in. But with the magic of injection moulding, he has made you the rig safe. Look at that, that's my one obviously, that's all my spare rigs in there. You can get like 75 rigs in it. I use the short ones end to end, at the double ended side and then the long ones on the other end there. Loads and loads of pins you get with it, nice little pins and you can put them in those little compartments as well. And then it snaps up nice and tight, virtually indestructible and then you've got a scale on the front there for measuring your rigs if you're that kind of a person. Let's put that one on there like that. That is about four inches, that one. So perfect little box for keeping your rigs in. They're not going to get wet, they're not going to get curly. Bang on. Being consistent with big fish is all about getting the technique right and using a good bait. And what we're going to show you when I've got this Maison Beast in, is the top quality boilie that I use in my fishing. Tell you a little bit about the history of it. And also some of the classic baits that are in the range and the new ones too. Without doubt, the most consistent anglers of any discipline are using good bait. And that's what we're here to talk about now, good bait, because there is a major difference between bad bait and good bait. To give you a bit of an insight into mainline, because that's the boilie that I've used for years, um, they're a bunch of Essex boys, just like me, and they started their firm before I started Calder, and I was fishing a lake called The Grange, and uh, a bait called The Grange came out, and it was called The Grange because it was field tested on that lake. And that particular bait turned anglers that normally get one or two fish a year out of that lake into 20 fish a year anglers. And they hadn't changed anything else that they were doing, it was just the bait they were on was so good. Naturally, I got straight onto it myself. It was rolled for us as well, which was a major, major step forward because rolling your own bait is a tedious task and takes forever. Um, but it was more the fact that it was catching so many fish. And ever since then, I've stuck on it because any bait the boys have ever given me has done really well for me. On any lake, I've fished all over the world with this bait and it has caught loads of fish on every single water. So to talk you through the range, this is how it all started. That is the Grange liquid. That's how it all started. And Mainline's theory on bait and their sort of process on bait is completely different to anybody else's. There aren't any strong flavors. There aren't any really potent attractors or anything else. Everything's very subtle and it's nutrition and food based, which mean when the fish eats it, it feels good for eating it, and then it wants to eat it again and again and again and again. And that's testament to any good bait. If it's catching the same fish over and over and over again, then it's a good bait because the fish love eating it. So to talk you through, after the Grange came out, the next one was Activate, and that is legendary. If you've not heard of Activate, God knows where you've been for the last 10 years, but it's caught everything everywhere. Still a brilliant bait, gets forgotten a lot of time now because there are so many other ones that have come out afterwards. And the way these baits progress, it's not, they don't think let's do a savoury bait or let's do a sweet bait. As new ingredients come available to these guys, that's when a new bait comes out. So if, if they go from a sweet bait one year to the, new, the next new bait is a savoury one, it's because a great new ingredients come available that no one else can get hold of and they put it into a bait and make a different bait. So every year, every couple of years, a new one comes out, but you can carry on using the old ones as long as you want. The grain still catches loads of fish and people forget about it. And then next to Activate is Fusion. That's one that I hold very, very dear to my heart because I won the British Championships on Fusion. Just from the second I started using it, I was catching straight away. Just absolutely superb bait. Again, I've taken it absolutely everywhere from the big French reservoirs down to little tiny lakes spread all around England and caught on it. And then the next one that came out was the Proactive Pineapple. And that was because the pineapple pop-ups that Mainline make are so popular with everybody, they said, can't you make a pineapple bottom bait? So they set about making the Proactive Pineapple. It tastes gorgeous. If you've ever eaten boilies, you can immediately tell when one tastes nice and one tastes horrible. And I eat more than that than I actually chuck in. And the most recent bait out is the Pulse. And the first time I used this, just put a single boilie on, whacked out a million miles on my favorite syndicate and had a 30 straight away. And that was with no bait going in the lake whatsoever. So food baits can also be very instant as well. They're very subtle smells and tastes, 
but the fish love them. You don't have to have something that's jumping out of the bag at you to get a bite. So if we move back onto the Fusion, I can talk you through all the different things that are available with each bait, because it's not just boilies anymore. There are so many other things available, and this can be applied to any type of fishing. If you're fishing for, for big barbel or big chub or big bream or tench, everything loves this stuff. And that can sometimes work against you if you're a carp angler. You're catching nuisance species as well, but I'd rather catch 10 bream and two carp than no carp at all. So next to the actual boilies, they come in different sizes. You can get them in 12, 16, 18 and 20 mil. Um, and then next to them, you've got the hook bait enhancement. Now you can use that in loads of different ways. One of the things that the guy said at Mainline to do, if you drill a little hole in the top of that bottle and put a baiting needle through and put some baits on it and then leave it in there the, all the time, it hardens the baits up and it actually draws into the baits over time. Now if you just leave them in there and they go really hard, you can't get a needle into them. So if you just keep putting them on the needle and leaving them in there, you can pull a bait on and it's got that little bit of extra zing to it. Now the other thing you can do is just pour it straight onto the bait or straight onto the pellets. Or if you want to combine this with the dry mix, you can mix the two together on the bank just in a bait box and make a fresh paste instantly with it. So there's loads of stuff you can do. It goes in a solid PVA bag as well. It won't melt the PVA bag. So there's a million things you can do with the enhancement system. One of the mistakes I've made in the past on the underwater films is I've soaked the hook baits in the neat attractor. That neat attractor is what goes into the actual bait when you're making the boilies. On its own, I think it's too strong. We've actually seen fish on the underwater coming over the top of it and not taking it. Yet the baits that were just, you know, these ones straight out of the bag, they are eaten with gusto. And that's another thing. If you look at any of the underwater films and watch the reaction from the fish to these baits, it tells you just how good they are. So that goes with the base mix. Really, really easy to make your own bait if you want to. And obviously it works out a little bit cheaper than buying the ready rolled ones. And then every single one gets its own pop-up. So rather than having to make your own pop-ups, they're done for you. Very buoyant, a mixture of sizes, and they smell very, very similar to the frozen bait. And then very, very recently, and these look like they're going to catch loads of fish, the dumbbells. Look really, really sexy, these ones and they've done these in a special way where there's no preservative in them at all. So they're shelf life baits, but there is zero preservative in them. That's how clever they are at making bait. And then next down to it, you've got the paste. Now you can use that and just mold it around the hook if you're fishing for smaller species, or you can mold it around a boilie to give it a bit of extra zing. Because when you boil something, you do lock a little bit inside it. If you put a bit of paste around the outside of the boilie, you're getting all that attraction, plus the security of having a boilie on the inside. And then for every single one of these baits, you've got pellets with them as well. They're available in small bags and big bags. And if you chop up the baits and put some pellets with it, that makes a fantastic spod mix. So those are the different options available for each of the baits. I think they pretty much cover every single situation. And if you're not convinced by the underwater films that I've done, the articles that I've written and the TV stuff that we've done using Mainline, just look at anglers like Dave Lane. He's had five different English 50s on five different Mainline baits. And that's what I was saying earlier on, that I'd be happy to use any of the baits because they're all so good. Now, one thing I must point out, the paste and the boilies both need to be frozen. They're fresh bait and they will go off if you don't refreeze them. So what I recommend you do at the start of the session, take them out of the plastic bag, put them into an air dry bag, use them during your session. If you don't use them all, chuck them back in the freezer in the air dry bag and you can use them again a couple more times. If you spend any amount of time carp fishing, you are going to get into making your own hook baits without a doubt. And once you start, there is no end to it because there are so many combinations that you can use. Now, if you're going to make your own pop-ups, that is the mix to use, the Polaris. You just mix it with eggs, just like a normal boily mix, chuck it in, roll it into balls, chuck it into the water and it floats straight away. Just boil it for a minute and you've got perfect pop-ups and they smell exactly the same as the flavour that you're putting in them. And one little tip with this, you can use like a one egg mix, or what I do is I just use the egg whites. So I use two egg whites rather than one full egg. And egg whites congeal quicker than a full egg will, so you don't have to boil them as longer. So rather than boiling it for a minute to make a hard boilie, you only have to boil them for 45 seconds. So just get rid of the egg yolk, use two whites, and then put the flavour into that. And flavours, well, the list of combinations is longer than my arm. You know, there are so many that you can choose from. I've just picked out a few classics for you. That's probably the most classic one of all time, pineapple juice. That's caught hundreds or thousands of carp all around the world. And what I do is I combine it with that one, with tangerine juice as well. And what I tend to do, I use more of the less 
powerful flavour. So the pineapple is a less powerful smell than the tangerine juice. So just to a one egg or two egg white mix, I'll use four mil of that and two mil of that. Now if you put that much flavour just into a one egg mix, remember the fish are not eating these baits, they're hook baits, by the time they taste the full flavour, you've hooked them. But even so, you don't want them to be really bitter. So if you add a bit of sweet aid to it, that's like a really nice round tasting sweetener. You could use that just as a flavour on its own. A couple of mil of that in with the six mil of flavour and that will give it a nice round taste. So when the fish picks it up, it doesn't spit it back out again because it's so harsh. A couple of the other real classics, sweet plum, that's one that used to catch loads and loads of fish and hardly anybody uses that anymore for some crazy reason. That was one of the best ones I ever used when I first started making my own baits. And then a more recent one, Frutella. That smells like the sweets that you get in the shop, absolutely superb. And then moving over to the other side, let's have a look. That's another one of the, the aids that actually triggers feeding as well as gives you the smell and taste. That peach aid with Scopex, that's a fantastic combination as well. And you can keep to the same thing, four of that, two of that, because that's a little bit more powerful flavour. Six mil to one egg is more than enough. And then lastly, but by no means least, black currant with Scopex as well. That's one of Frank Warwick's favourites. And I got into doing this stuff because I was fishing with Frank Warwick and he was out catching me five to one on his own little special hook baits. And every time I go fishing with him, he's got bags and bags and bags of them, like about 10 different bags of hook baits. And when you get into doing this, I'm sure you'll be the same. Colour wise, there's loads in the range. They're my two favourites, orange and yellow. They just seem to get more bites than anything else. But there's dark colours as well. And sometimes if everyone's using very bright pop-ups, try using really dark ones with the same flavours in them, but dark ones. So these are my own specials. And I've put those ones in. That's, that's a weird old smell. That's like a fishy flavour with pineapple in it as well. So you don't have to go with what you think is right. Combine two that are completely different and see how they work. And then the next one, these are my own pineapple ones with a little bit of tangy flavour in as well, so they're really, really citrusy. And if you've, if you've had them for a while, once I've boiled them, I dry them out for a couple of days, and once that initial moisture has gone out of the bait, they won't go off at all. And don't be afraid to put a couple more drops of flavour on every now and again, just to boost them up, and they'll just draw into that porous mix, and they'll smell brand new again. Now, they are lovely. And another really good little tip, right, they're the same. They're pineapple with a tangy flavour in there as well, to give them a real citrusy smell, but they're bottom baits. So I've made these with just a 50-50 base mix and they just sink just like any other bait. Everybody seems to use high-vis, high-attract pop-ups. These are high-vis, high-attract bottom baits because if fish are swimming around and every single one that's off the bottom has got something wrong with it, the fish can be wary of it. So if the others have been used to death, try a bottom bait. Very few people take the effort to do a one-egg mix of bottom baits and they've caught me a hell of a lot of fish. Now, if you can't be bothered to make your own, there are loads in the high vis range that Mainline do. That's the Fruitella. Pink's a really, really good colour, one of Frank's favourites as well. And there's loads of others in the range. There's loads of flavours as well. And it's only limited by your own imagination. Certain lakes respond to different flavours. So just keep trying, keep trying. You'll find one that is better than anything else. Well, that's it for boilies. One last tip. Days like today when it's really high pressure, on Sky Lake's quite deep. I'm going to start fishing hook links about that long, popped up off the bottom. So I'll use one of these high-vis pop-ups and I'll shave a little bit off it so it's a tiny, tiny little bait and you can snare some fish that are just drifting around, enjoying the sun when a bottom bait won't work. What we're going to have a look at now is particles because I use particles all the time in my fishing. You see, I've always spotted in the TV shows. We're going to show you the spot mixes and show you different particles and how to put them together and also show you some pellets as well. And then after that, we're going to go on to PVA and method feeders. Making a spod mix is not an exact science. And before you worry, you don't need everything that's here to make a spod mix. It doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. But what I'm going to do is show you the mix that I've been using at Maison and the one I'm using here at Sky Lake as well. To start off with, I've chopped up a kilo of boilies. In this particular mix, it's Pulse. I've chopped those up in a food processor. You can buy them for about 20 quid in your local curries. Because we've got the luxury of electricity here, I'm doing it on the bank. But you can do it before you go fishing. I'll just chop them up when I'm at the yard put them in the mix and then I'm ready to go. If you want to chop them up by the bank, then a food chopper is going to do that for you, but it takes a lot longer to do it. 
So uh, I recommend you get a food processor. It's only about 20 quid. And with those boilies, I've chopped up a few tigers as well. You can just see there's just a few tigers in with that as well. We've got some boilie crumb and chopped up boilies. And the reason for chopping the boilies is twofold. One, it comes out the spot much easier. And two, when it goes down to the bottom, there are no round boilies there to scare the fish because we've seen on pressured lakes like Sky and like Maison, when the fish come into the area, they avoid the round boilies to start off with. They'll eat all the bits and they'll avoid the round ones. So that's a good little tip that you can put into your own fishing. So those are the first two ingredients there. And then what I'm going to add to that is this new party mix. Really, really good stuff. Tastes gorgeous. It's cooked in the pots. All the stuff from Bait Tech is actually cooked in the pots. So all the goodness is sealed in. There's no preservative in it and it'll last for absolutely ages. So you can have a couple of these in the back of your car all the time. And if you run out, you can just open up another one. So I'm going to open up this one. It smells really aniseedy as well. It's got loads of different particles in it, but it's got loads of hemp in it as well, and that's why I like it. It's a really, really good mix on its own. You could spod with just this on its own. So if I pour a bit of that in... Right, now we're getting on to why it is so good. If I scoop a bit of that out, if you look at that... There we go, let's get some hook baits. There's loads of different size bits and pieces in there. There's a bit of maize in there as well. Now, you can use those bits of maize as a hook bait. So you could spod just that on its own, use a bit of ground bait to stodge it up, and that would be good enough. So one pot would do your spod mix, but I like to have a few different attractors in there because you never know what the fish are gonna like it when you get to the lake. So I'll empty that complete tub out of there, all the juice and everything as well. And before I mix it up, I'm gonna add the magic ingredient, salt. about a handful of salt. It's already cooked in salt and that just brings the flavour out of it. If you're ever going to cook your own particles, cook them in salty water. When you put salt in your potatoes, they taste better. When you put salt on your dinner, it tastes better. It's a taste enhancer. So just put that into your mix and then give it a slosh around. Now straight away, that is looking really, really carpy. We've got so many options here for hook baits. Over the top of this, I definitely have a chopped up pulse boilie with a few chopped boilies in a PVA bag on one rod. Maybe I'd have a bit of maize on another rod and then a tiger nut on another rod. Both fished with a little tiny PVA stick using the long chuck funnel web. And whatever one you start getting bites on, that's the one to get on all three rods. What a carpy mix that is on its own. And like I said, because the pellets that you put into this will absorb water, absorb water, and eventually go to mush. I put them in right at the end. So we're going to put a few pulse pellets in there, just because we're using a pulse boilie. If I was using the proactive pineapple, I'd put some of those in as well. And if your water's got a particle ban, what I'd recommend you do is use loads of different sizes of pellet, mix all those together, put a little bit of the hook bait enhancement system, the dips, in with it as well with the chopped boilie and you've got a great spod mix with no particle there as, at all. Now I've fished lakes before where particles have been banned. There you go, look at that. Particles have been banned and I've spotted anyway. Everybody else is using the throwing stick and just putting out whole boilies. I've spotted with chopped boilie and the pellets and caught loads of fish over the top of it. So while I'm letting all of that stuff soak up the juice from that party mix, it smells really aniseedy, really, really nice mix. I'll talk you through what else is in the range from Bait Tech. The furthest one away from it is brand new. That's only going to hit the shops in the next couple of weeks. It's chilli hemp, and we've had a bit of influence on that because we all use chilli hemp ourselves. So they're cooking it in the pot with chilli flakes in it. Really, really spicy, and fish absolutely love it. And then the normal hemp next to it needs no introduction at all tastes absolutely gorgeous, great big grains of hemp, really nicely split as well. And then the aniseed hemp, that's got a nice little twist to it, very aniseed, it's got some tiny little aniseeds in it to give it that smell, very, very distinctive. If nobody else is using that on your water, then that'd be well worth getting on. And then the pellets, they come in all sizes, from 20 mils right down to three mils. And the big three, the 20, the 16, and the 12 are all drilled. So if you want to put them on the hair, and use them like that, you can do. It's nice to mix a few of these in, especially in the summertime, because the halibuts are very high oil. Put them into your mix, put them in last so they don't go to mush. Fish absolutely love them. And then if you want to stodge the mix up, you can use that special G 
ground bait that's got loads of really good carpier tractors in it that will stodge it up or you can use that round the method feeder as well and then the mainline proactive soft, soft expander pellets can go in there as well these are the pulse ones because they're soft fish are onto them straight away and they really smell really pungent but we're going to use those later on in the pva section as well and then going over to the tigers these are the tigers that bait tech are going to bring out and they're only coming out in little tiny pots and i think that's a really good idea because the thing with nuts is you can put too many in the fish get full up on them they leave the swim before they've eaten your hook bait and you've missed your chance a little tub like that would do me an entire week on one of these venues, literally using one tiger on the hair, a little bit of tiger nut stick mix in a little tiny long chuck bag, and then just a few chopped up in my spod mix, that's it. You can really overdo it with tiger nut. So these tiny little pots are absolutely perfect. And a great mix if you're just gonna use hemp and tigers, use the standard hemp, a little pot of those, literally half the pot in with a whole pot of hemp, and then a little bit of that tiger nut syrup in with it as well. That clouds up the water, sticks the spod mix together so it doesn't come out the back of the spod so well. And you can put a little bit of that in your stick mix as well. And that's a really nice nutty sort of mix. And then moving over to the pellets, these, these time bomb pellets have got loads of different pellets in them. So they're all just breaking down at different rates. And again, if you can't put particles in and you can only spod pellets and chop boilies, that'd be a great mix to start off with and add some of your chop boilie into it. And last and by no means least, we've got the maize. Now, I've caught loads and loads of fish on maize. It's still very underused, and a great mix would just be a tub of hemp, a few grains of maize out of one of these into it as well, and just fish maize on the hair as a hook bait. Absolutely fantastic mix. And they've got a standard, a Scopex, a Tutti, and a strawberry flavour. And if you're fishing those commercial carp waters, you might find that one of these will outcatch the others. So try them all, put a few grains into your method mix as well, and then fish one on the hair with a little tiny hook like a 12 or a 10. That'll be very, very effective. So now we've given that a few minutes to soak in. The pellets will have expanded a little bit, and that will stick in the spod really well. But if you are losing anything out of the back of the spod, the best thing you can stodge the mix up with is a little bit of ground bait. What I'm going to use is this one is the new mainline stuff, this is the fishy one. Just a little tiny bit of that into there. That smells really, really fishy. If we had smelly vision here, oh, you'd be smelling that as well. Just a little bit of that into it, and then just give it a mix round. You don't want to stodge it up so much that it doesn't come out the back of the spod, but just enough so that it stays in in flight, so you're not spilling anything out the back. And then when it gets on the surface, it will just clear and give a nice cloud in the water and help everything else get down to the bottom. And if I was going to use a proactive pineapple mix, which is the one I was using mainly at Maison, I'd use the nut ground bait rather than the fish ground bait just to keep it all nutty together. So that's my spod mix. Now spodding is a bit of an art form as well and there is a technique to it. There is a way to get set so that the spod goes in the right position every single time. You need to get into a rhythm. So let's go back to Maison and see some long range spodding. Just like long range casting, long range spotting does have a technique to it and practice does make perfect. But the kit's also very important as well. So I'm gonna talk you through that. First of all, I've got an infinity spod rod, which is an extremely expensive spod rod. But when you think about it, if you can't get the bait out to where you can cast, what's the point in having the spod rod at all? So your best rod should really be your spod rod. So that's about four pound test curve. It's not actually rated for test curve, but it's one that I've helped design. Very, very light in the tip very easy to cast and a nice long handle on it as well. If you don't want to pay that sort of money, there's a longbow spod rod as well in the Dyer range, which is about a third of the price. And there's loads of other companies that make decent spod rods as well. And then the reel, again, is a spod reel, specifically for spodding. Looks really nice, you could fish with that as a carp fishing reel. Very discreet colours and logos and everything on it. And the thing that makes it good for spodding is the retrieve. The spod comes in really, really quickly. And believe me, when you're putting a spot out 100 yards, 20 or 30 times, it makes a big difference. The Bazier reels that I'm using for my fishing are 100 turns for 100 yards. These are 75 turns for 100 yards, 25 turns less. So 10 spots, that's 250 turns less. It makes a big difference. And on that great big spool, I've got 20 pound Berkeley Whiplash floating braid, very, very thin, cast like a dream. But you'll see when I'm actually spotting, you have to pay it a lot of respect. You have to keep wetting the braid up so that you don't get horrendous wind knots. And attached to that to take the force of the cast 
is a 30 pound Calder Armour Cord Leader, a braided leader material. Some people use 50, I can't snap the 30, so that's what I use. And I tie that on with a four turn water knot. And then the spot itself, that's my little baby. I spent a long time developing this. I do a hell of a lot of spotting. The Skyliner spot is totally unique, very, very lightweight. Because you know, if, so, if the spot weighs two ounces with nothing in it, you're casting two ounces every time for nothing. So that only weighs just about an ounce, as light as we can get it. Great big hole, so it comes in really, really easily. Very buoyant nose cone, so it comes up to the surface, even in the crosswind. And long, stiff tails on it to get the back out of the water. And you notice how I'm standing as well. I've got the bucket with the spot mix in it and the bucket with the water for washing my hand off directly in front of me. And it's all about getting into a rhythm. It's the same casting style as when I'm casting a rig a long way, but it's about getting into that rhythm. The worst thing you can do is keep doing that. Keep turning away from the lake all the time to get your spot mix. Have it all ready to go and then you're going to get into a rhythm. So let's start going. Couple of scoops up. I push the mix down into the spod with the same hand and then about half the length of the rod as the drop. Make sure your clutch is done up nice and tight and this is already clipped up at the range under the line clip and it actually goes. Run up in the air, that's just hit the clip, it's just taking the force out of it. You don't want to be hitting the clip with the rod pointing straight at the area because you could snap the braid. So as it gets out to where you want it, it hits the clip and just lay the spot down on the surface. Give it a couple of flicks just to make sure all the gears come out the end of it. Bail arm over, whip the braid up off the surface. When you wind in one of these Skyliner spots in, just keep a constant pace on it. Don't be striking against it or pumping it in. Just flick it along the surface, up to your hand into the bucket, two or three scoops, again push it down with your finger, wash your hand off so you don't cover your spod rod in goo, and I'm going to start on my back foot and transfer my weight through to my front foot as I cast. And out she goes, dink onto the clip, 100 yards with ease. Now I prefer to use braid on my spod reel but Adam Penning likes to use very very light mono he uses 10 pound infinity duo which absolutely flies off these reels they've got a great big line clip on them as well because you're going to use that line clip all the time once you've basically got the spod to the right range put the line under the clip on the spool and then it's never going to go further than that so as long as your direction is right it's always going to go out that distance and that means that you can spot at night if you want to without the marker float out there at all and providing you hit that clip and it goes in the right direction you're baiting up in exactly the same spot and that's one of the main reasons I really like spotting because it is so accurate once you get it right it's so so accurate day or night and in a summer session I'd probably start off with maybe 10 spodfuls over two rods and then top it up as I get bites. Some lakes you'll find you can, you can spot over the top of the fish and it actually increases the action and in other lakes if you spot on top of the fish, particularly this big lake at Maison, I found if you spot on top of the fish at night you don't get any more bites. So then I put out 20 or 30 spodfuls in the good periods when you're going to get a lot of action from sort of April through to October and then leave it. Other lakes I'll only put 10 out and then after I get every fish I'll put three more spodfuls out. No more than that, just enough to draw the fish back in and we've seen that on the underwater filming. You trickle a little tiny bit of bait back into the swim and the fish come back in to investigate. Your rig's already there and bang you get another one. We're going to start PVA off with the original funnel web system. If you've never seen it before or you've never fished with it before, where have you been? Have you never seen a magazine or seen a TV show about fishing or anything? Because it's everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And what we're going to do here is show you how easy it is to tie a bag and give you some good little tips on how to get more from the system. But first of all, this is why I use PVA. Right, we get two hook baits, okay? Consider they're both hook baits. 
Which one of those two is more attractive to the carp? Thought about it? It's got to be that one, hasn't it? It can't be that one on its own. They're both just as good as a hook bait, but that one's got another little pile of food around it. And that's why I use PVA all the time. They're three different systems. They do three completely different jobs. So let's have a look at the funnel web system first of all. For those of you that haven't seen the system before, it comes in a protective plastic tube. It's actually got a diagram on the outside of how to do it. Just take the inner tube out. And on that is five meters of PVA stocking with a knot tied in the end there. You're probably going to guess how I'm going to do this. Now I'm going to bring my pellet mix in. I've got three different kinds of pellet in there. I've got some bloodworm pellets from Mainline, some response pellets from Mainline, and some halibut pellets from Bait Tech. And the reason I've got three different kinds of pellets is they all fly up into the fish's mouth at different rates. So it's got to keep sucking to get the whole lot there. And then hopefully the hook bait's going to go in as well. And they've all got different breakdown times. So you're going to get a leakage of attraction coming off them pellets at different rates. So just a tiny, tiny amount of going down. That's, and that's a major thing that people do wrong with PVA is they use far too many pellets in the bag. You're just trying to hook them. You're not trying to feed them. So that is the maximum that I'll use in one of these kind of bags. Just pour it down there. Let some drop down. And that's the thing that a lot of people do wrong. They don't let enough PVA off the end of the tube. So that's already, that bag's starting to form already. And then I'll do a simple overhand knot, like a simple granny knot. You see the knot there? And then I'll hold the bag at the very top and then pull the knot down onto the top of the bag. So I've got a nice tight bag there. And you probably guess what I'm going to do next. I'm going to do another simple overhand knot. You see that knot there? And then I'm going to pull that knot down so it's close to the first one. And then I cut between the two. That's your bag done. And then your system is ready for another go. And it is as simple as that put that back in the tube and then hooking it on I've got a little tiny pellet a 10 mil pellet on the rig there and that's another great tip the smaller the size of the stuff in the bag the smaller your hook bait should be the worst thing you can do is use little tiny dust pellets even smaller than the ones I'm using today and then couple that with a 20 mil boilie because those fish are feeding on those little pellets when they suck that boilie and it doesn't go up in their mouth because it's miles heavier they can leave it so keep your hook bait similar, just hook that on so you can see. That's just hooked through the side of the bag, away from the knot, because the knot is the last thing to melt, and that's ready to go. Just cast it out like that, and you're away. The other advantage of using bags this size is they cast really easily, and because they only take a few seconds to make up, if you cast them in the wrong spot, which we all do, it's simple enough to wind it in, make another bag and cast it out again. And if you spent 10 minutes making a solid PVA bag, which is huge and difficult to cast, and then you get that in the wrong spot, there's less likelihood you're going to wind it in because it's such a pain to do another one. So if you've used funnel web quite a bit, there's a few little tips I can give you for spicing up your mix a little bit. So we put that down and we show you the mix again. So we've got a nice mix of pellets and there's a few liquids that you can actually put in them. First of all, the pellet syrups. They're really, really good. You can just pour them straight onto them. Just chuck that on there. You can't overdo these, completely impossible to overdo them. And I'm going to use my compressor stick just to mix that in. That's the halibut one. Doesn't melt PVA. And just spices them up. You can really smell that halibut smell. Fish absolutely love fish oils and fishy smells. And that's just spice that up straight away. Just one little thing like that can get you extra bites. There's another couple of things that you can add to the pellets as well to spice them up a little bit. The hook bait dip for one that you put on the boilies normally, a little dribble of that on top is going to add pulling power. And also foss oil, which is a really thick fish oil. In the summer it's brilliant, in the winter it's no good because it congeals, but fish absolutely love fish oil. A little dribble of that on your pellets will add pulling power as well. Now when you've used the system up, there are two refills. That's the one that comes on the system, the three season refill. That'll still melt in about a minute and a half, even in the winter, because we've reduced the amount of PVA in it recently to bring the melt time down as low as humanly possible. And then there's a four season refill as well, which is a micro mesh. So the holes are even smaller than the one you've just seen. So you can get tiny, tiny dust pellets in, and most importantly, maggots. Maggots are brilliant in a funnel web system. If you couple it with a few maggots on a maggot clip, especially in the winter, you can get bites when nothing else is working. And next up it's the boilie funnel web, 
slightly smaller than the original funnel web and you can still use that for putting pellets down and it'll actually make a smaller bag which means you can cast it further and if you are going to do that I recommend you keep the hook bait as small as possible so one of those new dumbbells from mainline will be absolutely perfect but it wasn't for that it was designed to be used with boilies and what I'm going to do now is make a stringer without the PVA string going through the middle it's actually going to be on the outside so it doesn't matter how cold the water is it can still attack the PVA the baits will burst open and you've got a lovely little spread of bait so let's do that now so take it out of the protective tube as always get that out of the way just get that back down onto the end. the little tip if this is falling off the end of the tube when you first get it if you just dab the end of the PVA it will hold it nice and tight on that end there and stop it all falling off the end. You get a little bit fall off the end, but you can always put it back on again pretty easily. I'm going to get three boilies, one, two, three, through there, and then let those drop down. Make sure you've got loads of PVA to work with. And what you want to do before you tie the bag is put the baits slightly out of line, like that. The reason for doing that will become clear in a second. We do our simple overhand knot again, and pull the knot down as tight as you can, onto those boilies and then another overhand knot and again as close together as possible that means you waste as little PVA as possible because that's the beauty of this system you're not wasting any PVA cut between the two right now just straighten those boilies out to put that PVA under more tension and what's going to happen when I cast that it's going to go beautifully straight and when it goes into the water, as the PVA melts, it will contract and it will get tighter and tighter and tighter. And in the end, it will burst and it will actually throw the baits apart. Now, when you're fishing a normal stringer with the string going through the middle, the baits are always in a straight line. And if the fish are used to seeing that, they can shy away from it. So if your baits spread apart a little bit, it's going to be a random pattern every single time you cast out so the fish can't associate it with danger. So to attach this to the hook link, I'm not putting another bait on. One of these baits is going to become the hook bait. So I get my little fine gate latch needle that just goes through one of the baits at either end, doesn't matter which end. And then I'm going to bring the hair into play just by hooking that onto the latch, onto that little hook of the gate latch needle. And I'm just going to spin that round because I'm right-handed and then just pull the hair through that bait. So that's now sort of semi-attached and then to stop it pulling back through I get my hair stops, a long little strip of hair stops because I can break it off once it's on and then I've just pulled that, you see there, just pulled that and stopped that getting off of there and then that just breaks away. So that's how it will sit on the cast and then once it's in the water, the PVA will obviously melt, the whole thing will explode, that bait will be attached, and these two will be round it. And it's just a nice little mouthful of food, and that's the way that Damien and myself won the British Championships, just casting two bait stringers effectively over the top of a spod mix. There were loads of bream in the lake, and if we put bags of pellet on, we caught a bream straight away. But we worked out in practicing, if we fished boily stringers over the top of the spod mix, we didn't catch any bream, and we caught loads of carp. And the last thing to do, is just to, to stop it tangling on the cast is to just hook through the PVA like that so if I hold it up for you that's just going to hang lovely and straight it's not going to fly around on the cast and when that gets to the bottom it's going to explode so that's all we've got time for today as you can see the light is dropping I've got three zig rigs out which haven't roared off today so I'm going to get the rods back in get them clipped up again get some rigs on for the night obviously fishing on the bottom a little bit of spot mix over the top and in the morning I'm going to show you the final funnel web system the long chuck Nothing actually happened for me last night. I managed to get a bit of bait out before it got dark. And uh, I had a funny occurrence this morning, which may or may not have been a carp. So later on this afternoon, I'm gonna take the lines out of the water for a few hours and rest and swim a bit, put a little bit more bait in with no lines in. And that's something you can take into your own fishing. If you're doing a session, you don't have to have rods in the water the whole time. If you're not getting bites at a certain time of the day, take the rods out of the water, rebait the swim, let the fish swim around seeing the bait, with no lines in the water and just chuck the rods in like I'm going to do just before it gets dark 
and then hopefully the fish will come back in with confidence and feed because they haven't been seeing lions all day long. But Adam, on the other hand, is fishing absolutely brilliantly. Um, he's got his own little bay over there and he's caught a fish from a spot I would never put a bait, um, a 43 pounder, so very good angling from him. But back onto the PVA, this fella here took me two years to persuade the boys at Calder to put into the range. I wanted it for my own fishing. They said there wasn't a market for it, and lo and behold, they all now use it. Now, it's called the long chuck funnel web for casting, the long chuck as we call it. Now, I wanted a little tiny PVA stick to go out 140, 150 yards so that I could fish sticks at ranges that nobody else on my lake could fish them. And it proved to be extremely effective. In the winter time, you couldn't put any bait in because the tufted ducks were so bad. And I was the only person getting consistent action. And a little tiny stick that I'm gonna show you in a second was getting all the bites. Just a stick about that big, one little tiny dumbbell hook bait, and that was enough to get a bite. Just out in the middle of nowhere. And the mix is the all important thing. And the secret ingredient in there, not secret at all really, is tuna. Just tuna straight out of the tin, straight from your supermarket. The one in brine rather than the one in oil, because fish love salt, and oil in the winter time can congeal, and the fish don't process it very well, so that sometimes they can shy away from it. But just literally, a tin of tuna into there, some bloodworm pellets over the top of it, and then some fishy style ground bait. I'm using the mainline one, I've used the sticky baits one in the past as well. Just mix a whole lot together, it's roughly a third of each. Mix a whole lot together until you get to that sort of consistency. And the thing I've added most recently is ground chilli peppers. Now, chilli's obviously very, very hot. I put it in my hemp and the fish absolutely love that. I was talking to Adam about it and he said some of the guys from Sparsholt College were putting corn in that was so hot you couldn't even put it in your mouth. They were dropping it in the tank and the fish were going mad for it. So I've added those ground chilli peppers just to spice things up a bit. Now, to show you the system, it actually comes with the compressor in it, still in your waterproof out of shell, let's get that there. And the thing that most people do wrong with this is they try and scoop it up and get it into that little tiny funnel in the top. Yeah, so all I do is just scoop it against the side of the bait box that I've used to mix it up in. And then the compressor stick down the end there, make sure the PVA is nice and tight, thumb over the end, and then just really press it down so it goes into a nice compressed stick. Just push it out the end with the PVA under a bit of tension. Take your compressor out the way. And again, use loads of PVA so you can tie your knot easily. Hold the top of the bag and then pull the knot down onto the top of the bag. And then the same thing again. Hold the knot where you want it to be on the PVA. Pull it tight and you're done. And then as always, cut between the two. You might notice that the PVA itself is very, very fine. We find it down recently, so even in the winter time, a stick's gonna go in about 30 seconds. And for some reason, this particular PVA melts faster with a stick than it does with a bag of pellets. Normally, it's the other way round. Even so, don't make your sticks up a long time in advance. I make them up literally as I go in the winter. You can make them up a couple of hours before in the summer, but no more than that, because any of the juices that you've got in that stick mix will soak into the PVA and massively extend the melt time. Right, now threading it on, you can hook it on the end if you want to, but what I'm gonna do is use a heavy gate latch needle, and that just goes through the middle of the stick and out the other side. You can use a hook link with a loop on the end. I've crimped on a link loop onto this hybrid hook link, which is my preferred way, into, oh, into that gate latch there, like that, so nothing will catch. You do break a couple of bits of PVA when you pull this through, but don't worry about that broke a couple on either side of the, of the stick and then I'm pulling the hook link right the way into the end of the stick like that. So there's no way that hair can tangle, no way the rig can tangle because you've got an extra bit of weight on there and it tends to hold the rig away from the anti-tangle system so you don't get any tangles in flight and then when it goes to the bottom you've got that lovely little spread of bait around it just enough to get a bite and whatever that lands on there's no way the hook can foul up in anything so absolutely perfect. And then I would slide on a little bit of silicon onto that hook link, like that. That's part of our, our range, that's a three mil silicon sleeve that I've just cut down. And on the end of the lead system, if I can just turn that around, show you, is a quick link. You can use a stick clip or a quick link. And I'm literally just hooking the link loop onto that and then covering it up with a bit of silicon 
so there's no way that can get back off. And that is the rig done. And when you see that hanging up, you can see how streamlined everything is. There's just no way that's going to tangle. And that's how to make the stick. There's a couple of other mixes that I'd recommend as well, so let's have a look at those. The next little tip is something you can use whenever you're spodding. So I'm going to get my spod mix out now. And what I'm effectively going to do is make a stick mix. That's my spod mix there, chopped boily, bit of the party mix from Bait Tech, a few chopped tigers and that sort of thing in there. Loads of hemp in with it. Just put that into a bait box, okay? Make sure there's no real big bits in it. Now obviously that is too wet to go in a PVA stick, but with the addition of this little fella, the hemp stick mix from Mainline, just a little bit like that, and using my compressor to stir it round, all I'm doing is just drying it out enough to get it in a stick. It's not wet, and it's not dry. It's sort of in between, and all my stick mixes are like that. They're just slightly moist, so they'll go in a stick, I reckon that's about right there. They'll go in a stick, they won't melt the PVA for the first couple of minutes. You can whack them out onto the spot. And what you've effectively got there is a little pile of spod mix sitting around your hook bait. So rather than having a pile of pellets like everybody else uses, you've actually got the same stuff that you're spodding sitting right next to the hook bait. And that with a little bit like a little fusion chop or a little bit of chopped tiger or a bit of maize on the hair, fish with that is going to get you a lot more bites over a spod mix. So that's that one. And the other one is the one that I used to very, very good effect at Maison. That's my nutty stick mix. So we've got a fishy one, a spod mix one, and then a nutty one. I've got crushed up nuts there that I've done in the blender or I use the old boilie chopper to chop them up. I've got some chopped up, very, very finely chopped boily. This is the proactive pineapple. That look, look, works really well with the nut mix. It's really, really sweet, and after a couple of days, it just gets sweeter and sweeter. And with that, I'll just use a tiny bit of tiger nut or a peanut or something like that on the end, fished over the top of the spod mix. And there are certain times when particle baits are going to outfish boilies, certain times it's the other way around. So what I try and do is have that on one rod, and I'll have the savoury one on at least one of the other rods, and then maybe just a single hook bait on the third rod and see which starts working and then switch all rods over to that. So that sticks. Avoid them at your peril. I see very, very few people using them. You can use them in all the sizes, the boily funnel web size and the funnel web size as well. They can both have compressors to go with them. And I'll use that big size if I'm fishing the great big reservoirs out in France somewhere and I want a great big stick on because it's going to be out there ages waiting for a big one to turn up. That is the way to do it. We're going to talk to you about method feeders now, and I've enlisted our Mr. If It Swims, Catch It, Ali Hamidi, <laughs> who's very well connected on the match circuit to talk to us about mixes. But first of all, I'm going to talk to you about the feeders themselves. This is the original Bait Up method feeder. It's called Bait Up because one of the fins is made of lead, so it will always fall one way. Even if there's bait around it, it will always fall that way. So if you've got your hook bait folded in to the top of it there, the hook bait will always be exposed. What you don't want to happen is that be trapped underneath the feeder and that can't happen with this one because of that lead fin. This comes in an ounce and a half, two ounces and three ounces respectively. It's got all its little nips and crannies in there to push your bait into so the fish have to really hit it to get it all off and a bait shield as well. So when you're casting it stops the bait coming off the end of the feeder. And the rig with this particular one, I've got a little tiny 10 mil halibut pellet there that I've just drilled out and I've got a little tiny extender stop to hold that on so it will stay on a bit longer, and just a hybrid hook link. But that'll become clear while we're doing that when we talk about mixes. And then the more recent one, the mini bait up for the more commercial fisheries. This one's attached to a safe zone leader. The other one I had rig tubing on it, and both of them are to protect the fish. So when you're playing the fish, it's rubbing against the fish's scales and it's not pinging them off like mono can. And also it holds everything flat down on the bottom behind the feeder. So when the fish are feeding, you don't get loads of line bites. And this one is attached to a little tiny braided hook link, a size 12 wire gape. Obviously, if barbless rules apply, it'd be a wire gape B. And then two of Mainline's strawberry pellets, the little soft hooker pellets on the end there. And that comes in half an ounce and an ounce. But what we want to get onto is mixes. So talk, to, talk us through the green sort of fluffy stuff that you've got in there. Fluffy stuff. Well, it's all... All off the back of the humble words of Mr. Ringer, basically. <laughs> so w when he speaks, I listen, as, as everyone does. So um, he's, he's always spoke about how important it is now not to feed the fish, but to try and catch them, exactly like you say with the PVA. Okay? Yep. So the ground bait is basically Special G from Bait Tech. Okay? Right. I've 
put in the addition of a new one from Mainline. It's called the Activated Fish Mix. Okay, and there's lots of little lumpy bits of fish meal in there, so it just smells. Dark. It's carpet, yeah. yeah. You've got to use it. And then the important thing is not to have too much loose feeding. Okay, I've got literally in in that sort of half a kilo of mix, I've probably got a handful of three mil halibut pellets. Right. And um, backing that up is another handful of the um, strawberry expander pellets from Mainline. So hardly anything really. Right. And if you look in that, Dan, look, you know, just have a look. It's it's dust with a sprinkling of little pellets. So right. the only thing there for them to eat is the hook bait. Is that fella. Right. Yeah. So when you know when they when the dust has come up, right. they're on it. And how long is that lasting on the feeder then? Well what what Steve's always said to me and a lot of the top match boys have said ninety seconds, okay? They're, really? they're, they're casting it out. If it's not gone within 90 seconds, it's straight back in. And, and a lot of the time, they won't even leave it out for 30 seconds to start with. It'll be out, whisk whisk it off to get the feed off, back in. And they'll do that for eight or 10 casts until right. they've got a little bed down and then out will go the feeder. Right. Periodically, every 90 seconds. Right. Same as the bagging waggler, how they started all that. You know, it's mad. This, yeah. I feel like I've been here for 90 days. Yeah. About, <laughs> about, about 90 seconds. Exactly. Cool. So that one, you, you just, I take it, you're just moulding the feed round it. What yep. about how do you have the, do you have the bait in it or out of it? What, what works best? Yeah, that's that's another really interesting subject. Um, basically, I've been told that on some waters, yeah, some of the commercial fisheries, you get more bites with it out of the feeder, and then on other ones, you get more bites with it in the feeder. So the top tip there is to keep it, you know. Know, try it in and try it out and right. whatever's working on the day use that method right okay and then that one's obviously completely different that looks more like what I would put in a PVA bag or I would spot out so what's in that one and why is it so different from that one okay well this is something we're more likely to use as big fish anglers okay it's it's based around much um, much coarser mix full of a lot more feed okay so right. that it can um, withstand the attention of small fish yeah so when you're casting out it might take a night for the fish to get on it, you want some bait left there. Cool. And in there I've got six mil halibut pellets, okay? I've mm -hmm. got um, a nut mix from Mainline, a, a new activated nut mix, and as you can see, look, there's tiny bits of nut in there. Okay, we've got ground bait, response pellet, and then once I've scalded that whole lot up, okay, mm -hmm. and it, it's starting to bind, I'll then add some party blend. I've added the bait tech and a seed party blend, and you know, and a bit of May plate juice, and if you smell that, mate, that's not bad, is God, it? Oh, mate, that's that's all spicy and God, that that is extremely carpy, as we say, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Cool. And um, I, f I think it's important if we show them, show the audience what it looked like if you're casting it into thick weed, because that right, would be okay. a, you know a really effective way of doing it. Right. So correct me if I'm wrong here, because I don't use the method hardly at all. I've used it a couple of times. A little bit in the palm of your hand, press the lead weight into it. Yep. Yep. And then a bit more on the top, and then mould it so it's roughly the same all the way around the feeder. Yep. And uh, am I right in saying you could even cast that out as it is now with a hook bait out of it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But oh. don't strike when the old bobbin's going up and down because right. that can happen. I'll start headbutting the feeder. Right. Yeah. Until cool. it screams off. Wait yeah. until it screams off. <laughs> yeah. Or then you could fold it back like that if you wanted to. Yeah. And then put a bit more feed on top of it. And if you were going to chuck that into weed like they do on places like Horseshoe, that's the way to do it. And even like that, that's only going to fall one way and no bait's gonna come off that until it hits the bottom. Definitely not, mate, yep, until a big carp comes and chomps it up. Excellent, well, I'm gonna have a bit more of a go with the method this year. We've got a guy that we've just taken on as a consultant who I'm not gonna tell you about, who only fishes the method. So maybe this time next year, I'll be talking about a load of big fish caught on the method. Now, I have to admit, it's a complete pleasure to be able to share my personal best common with quarter of a million viewers. 45 and a half pound of Piraway Maison de Lac Bleu common carp. Look at that. Taken on a safe zone leader, wide gate B hook, flying back lead. Everything just fell into place with this fish. And to say I'm happy is a major understatement. Well, almost 13 years ago, Calder started just making leads. It was me in my kitchen with a stainless steel dog bowl, making leads, just pouring them by hand. And we've come a long way since then, and the range has grown massively. And what I want to do now is talk you through the different leads in the range. But before I do, 
I want to talk to you about lead camouflage because I think ever since the underwater films have come out, there's been this panic from everybody about the camouflage aspect of leads and what you need to put on them. And there are leads coming out with tree bark on them and gravel on them and then yellows and whites and reds and everything else. And the whole world seems to have gone lead camouflage crazy. Now, camouflage only works if what's around the lead blends in with what it's lying on. So you can't chuck a gravel coated lead out onto silt and it suddenly disappear. It just doesn't work like that. And what we've done is we've kept with two colours, but we've actually taken samples of the lake bed, sent those off to the people that make the colours, and then they've sent them back so we know that the brown is as universally a gravelly, muddy colour as possible, and the green works in as many places as possible when you've got a slight covering of weed. And that's why we do it. And if you drop these leads into the edge, you can see how well camouflaged they are. But whatever lead you're using, make no mistake, you can't put something round it, drop it onto any lake bed, and the whole rig suddenly disappear. You have to camouflage everything, and it has to blend in. So first of all, we're going to talk about the latest lead, which is the square pair, a very, very condensed shape. The more condensed any shape, the less distance the fish has to move to feel the full weight. So the square pair in an inline, bearing in mind, the swivel is going to be set up inside the nose of the lead, is going to have hardly any movement before the fish feels the full weight of the lead. On the swivel lead it's slightly more because it's picking the lead up from the thin end first rather than the fat end first, but it's still a very condensed shape and that makes a very, very good bolt rig. The pear lead was one of the first ones in the range and it still remains really popular today. Even anglers like Terry Hearn still use pear leads. Now it started off as a ball lead and what we did was elongated it. Ball leads are great because they're very condensed, but they tangle. So close to the swivel, we've just sloped it in nicely, just tapered it in, so there's a lot less chance of a tangle. The leads come in very small sizes, down to one ounce for people who are just flicking leads into the edge or for specialist anglers, right up to four ounces as well. And they're good for short and medium range. Long range leads, you need to move on to a distance lead, which we're gonna look at now. The distance lead is probably the one I use most in the range because I often find myself fishing a long way out. It's different from most other distance leads because again, it's quite a condensed shape. It's got a bullet nose to it. And the most important thing is two thirds of the weight are condensed into the bottom third of the lead. And that keeps it very, very stable in flight. And you'll notice when you're casting into crosswinds and stuff, this one will keep going straight where other leads will wobble off. Again, available in all the sizes from one and a half right up to five ounces for you nutter casters. And also, it's available in an inline that we call a Skyliner. Exactly the same shape, a hard insert as with all our inline leads, and the size eight swivel fits up inside the nose of the lead as standard. The tournament casting lead is Frank Warwick's favourite design, and it's a very carpy shape, a classic shape. We've taken the shape from the UKSF tournament casting guys that use this shape for their long range casting competitions and we've changed it from the original zip shape by putting more weight into the nose of the lead so it's more stable in flight. It's got a pointed nose that cuts through the air brilliantly, excellent on lead clips, excellent on helicopter rigs and if you're going for extreme range this is the lead for you. The flat pair lead is my favourite lead for fishing up to 100 yards range. It won't cast as far as a distance lead, but it's got a very condensed shape and two flat sides, which give excellent hooking potential. And the flat sides also make it really good for using with a marker float because there's more lead touch in the bottom, so you feel more down the line on the marker float. Now it's available in swivel and in line, and it goes right down to one ounce for all you specialist anglers and people that are just chucking amongst feeding fish, right up to five ounces for all you nutters like Ali Hamidi, who likes a great big lump of lead on the line to set the hook and the inline version is great as a semi-fixed inline or really good on the shocker rig as well and because it looks more like a stone than any other lead in the range it's one of the ones that I use on the underwater films as much as possible. Inline leads have come back into fashion recently and I hope it's got something to do with the underwater films because I've been using them on there to very good effect on hard gravel bottoms. The flatliner distance lead works really well on a hard bottom just like all the other inlines in the range but it's a distance shape which means if you cut it down the cross section, it's got a very similar shape to one of our distance leads, but it's still got four flat sides on it. So whatever way it lands, it's got to land on a flat side. And I've used this to really good effect with short, stiff rigs. And the reason it works so well is it holds the hook link swivel actually off the lake bed so it can pivot around and get into the fish's mouth really easily. So if you combine it with a very short 25 pound IQ hook link, a soft hair and a bottom bait, you'll get loads of takes when fishing over boilies. And finally, the gripper lead. Now, this one came from the old watch leads that people used to use for sea fishing. I was using the watch leads for swinging my baits out over the boat and then rowing back to shore, but every now and again, they tangled. 
So what we've done is just curved them in nicely towards the loop and swivel area. That means if the hook link wraps around it, it'll easily slip off and the rig won't tangle. And it comes in sizes from a one ounce right up to a massive 10 ounce. So you can do anything from fishing for barbel and chub and stuff on a little tiny river, right up to fishing the massive reservoirs and the rivers in Europe, which have got really strong currents. Now, the reason that it holds bottom so well are these pimples on it and also the hole in the middle. And purely by accident, they're also really good in silt because they don't sink in so far because it's in a regular shape. They're also really, really good for using on marker floats because the pimples, again, send loads of tremors down the line. If it's weedy, they do clog up, so only use them on a marker if you're fishing silty lakes that have got a bit of gravel and then a bit of silt. They're excellent for telling the little tiny differences between the two. Now, I keep all different shapes and sizes in my bag all the time because I never know what fishing I'm going to encounter, and that's a mistake a lot of anglers make. They use one lead, one size, one shape everywhere, and they don't adjust it to suit the bottom. And I think if you adjust things around so your rig's absolutely perfect for the spot you're fishing on on that day, you'll get more bites. So now you've got all the information that you need to know about lead designs, there's no reason to get it wrong. The lead clip is probably the most universally used lead system in carp fishing today, and quite rightly so, because it is so versatile. But it's also the one that people get wrong the most. I've been writing about this little fella for maybe 10 years now, and I still see people doing it wrong. And the major mistake that people make is the swivel that goes in the end of the lead clip isn't in tight enough. It gets pulled in about half the distance, and when you get a take, it pulls out the end, and that means the lead will never come off. If the swivel pulls out before the lead comes off, the lead will never release. Now inside that lead clip is a little tiny ridge of hard plastic, and when you pull the size 8 swivel into it, it should click past that ridge. If it does, that means it's in tight enough. And then the other mistake people make is they ram that rubber connector on as far as they possibly can and they do it dry as well. What you need to be doing is wetting the back of the clip with saliva and then pushing the rubber on and off a couple of times just to get the saliva underneath it and then it'll work properly. And this is the test. Hold the lead like it's got snagged during the fight, pull against it like a fish would and off the lead comes. Now, if the swivel pulls out before that's happened, then your system's not working properly. You need to pull the swivel in so it clicks past that little ridge, wet it again, put the rubber on, and it should work the next time around. And the more you push that rubber on, the harder it is for the lead to come off. So if you only have it on halfway, the lead will almost come off on the take. So if you're fishing for big uns and you're only getting a few takes a year, that's the way to fish it. If you're fishing easy lakes and you're getting loads of takes in a day, you don't want to lose the lead every single bite, so have it pushed on all the way. Now this one I've set up with rig tubing. All I've done is cut the, the tubing to a point, and then I've cut the end of the line to a point as well before I've started to thread it, because if you bite the line and try and thread it through, it makes it really difficult. So the line's gone straight through there, through the rubber connector, and that tubing cut to a point is easily just pushed into the end of that rubber connector, wet the back of the clip, and then it's on. And at the other end, I've got a quick link, and that's so I can take the hook link on and off really easily without having to pull that swivel out of the leg clip. The more I pull that swivel in and out, the more I'll be wearing the ridge down, and that's when it can keep pulling out for no reason. So if you use a quick link, it's going to make the system last longer. And I've just covered that up with a little bit of 3mm silicon. And I've got one of my favourite link loops on the end there. Now, since this lead clip came out, there's been a new development with them. And we've brought out a product called a hybrid lead clip, where the swivel is actually moulded inside the lead clip. So there's no way it can pull out at all. So let's show you that one. And there it is, the hybrid lead clip. It may look fairly insignificant to you, but to me that is a thing of beauty. That has taken a hell of a long time to get right, mainly because that moulded swivel inside the lead clip is so hard to keep in place when we're moulding that around it. But the old injection moulders have done it in the end, and they've done it in the safe zone colours as well. So all the lead clips, rubbers and hybrid lead clips are now available in the transparent colours to blend in even better on the bottom. You can see there, the main line is just tied to that eye. If you want to use lead core, you just loop to loop it on. And then at the other end, we've given you a ring swivel so you can tie the hook link directly to the ring swivel if you want to. Or what I do, I chop the ring swivel off and I replace it with a quick link from a quick change hook links. Exactly the same rules apply. Just wet the back of it, push on your rubber connector and hold it and then bang, off it comes. And because that swivel cannot pull out, the lead has to come off. So to my way of thinking, this is the only system that 100% guarantees you're going to eject the lead. 
So that's all you need to know about how to set up leg clips correctly. And if you've never used them before, that's what you want to get onto. A leg clip action packet. It's got five of everything in there to make up five rigs. And then the Safe Sun leaders have just come available with the hybrid leg clips on as well. And a couple of the other reasons people use leg clips is you can change the style and weight of the lead without having to cut the line. And you can also take your leads off your rods when you're not fishing them so you don't clatter your rods around. Rigs, 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 rigs. Let's have a look at some more rigs. Shooting parts five and six coincided with my local syndicate banning semi-fix rigs. Now I thought I'd start getting twitchy bites on there, but on the contrary, I've got just as many runs, if not more. And I think that's because the fish were used to semi-fix rigs, you gave them a running rig and they just didn't know how to deal with it. But the one major downside with running rigs is they do tend to tangle. So what we've been doing over the last year is developing a run rig rubber, which stops that happening. And the reason it stops it happening is the same reason that makes a leg clip so good for anti-tangle. Can you see there the lead and the hook link are laying almost parallel to each other. Rather than it kicking out at an angle, they're lying side by side. And I think that's why a lead clip is so good for anti-tangle. Now this one I've got set up on a safe zone leader. And what I've basically done is I've slid the lead on the line first, then the run rig rubber, which is that little fella there, that's gone on the line. And then I've tied the leader on with my normal Palomar knot, which is what I favour, tying onto a leader with mono. And then I've just pulled the ring swivel into the end of that run rig rubber. So that's in there really, really tight. That's not meant to pull out, because obviously that's meant to slide down the leader. Now in this instance, I've actually cut the ring of the ring swivel off and replaced it with a quick link, because as you know, I like changing my hook links really, really quickly, and that suits my style of fishing. Now if you want to keep the ring swivel on, all you need to do is either loop to loop the hook link onto it, or just tie a half blood knot or a palomar knot, whatever you like to tie, onto that ring swivel because you want a pivot point there. You want the hook link to fold back in flight and lay against the leader. And that's what will stop tangles. So if you're getting tangles on any rig whatsoever, if you just add a hinge at that point, it will reduce the amount of tangles that you get. Doesn't matter what material you use, doesn't matter what lead system you use, it will reduce the amount of tangles. Now that's it set up for a safe zone leader. You can do exactly the same thing with a lead core leader. And I've got one here set up with tubing. And the run rig rubber really suits tubing as well because the tubing just pushes into the end there. I've just cut that tubing to a point. So I've slid the lead on the line first, threaded the tubing, cut it to a point, and then just pushed it into the end there. And on the cast, there's no pressure on that point there. All the pressure is on that shoulder. And that's why this rig sits so well, is because of that specially angled shoulder. And you need a large eye swivel, which comes as standard on all the calder leads, for it to sit that well. And if for some crazy reason you're not going to use a calder lead, we do do a run rig kit, which means you can cut the swivel off the lead and replace it with a much larger eye swivel, and that'll sit beautifully like that as well. And you can see on the front there, I haven't got a ring swivel on there this time. I've just got a normal size eight swivel, and that's an anti-tangle sleeve, which Frank Warwick has sort of forced us to bring out. And what that does is it pushes the hook link away from the lead. So if you're experiencing tangles of any kind, just put on an anti-tangle sleeve or create that hinge like I've already showed you, and that should stop it. Now, this is obviously for running rigs with swivel leads. You can fish in lines running as well. So let's have a look at the shocker rig. And this is it, the shocker rig. Incorporating an inline lead, I've taken the insert out of that square pair inline and threaded it onto a safe zone leader. And the ring of the safe zone leader stops it sliding off the end. And then I've put a little tiny four mil rubber bead again from the safe zone range on the back and that's going to act as a backstop so when the fish picks up the rig the lead slides away and hits that backstop and bam just startles them and because this rig works so differently to anything else it is really really effective on those really hard waters no good when it's weedy because the fish go off at such a rate they're in the weed before you even pick the rod up but if you're fishing a pressured water where it's a hard bottom because obviously inlines are only going to work on a hard bottom on a soft bottom they'll drag the whole lot in so it's got to be a hard bottom a pressured water no weed and snags around and you can use that to very, very good effect. And you see there, I've got it with a very short hybrid hook link. That's the way I favour it. That's what works so well in parts five and six of the Underwater series. My mate Andy turned over Maison last year. I think he had nine fish, three fifties up to 58 pound, all on that rig. So if you're fishing a pressured water, running in lines on the shocker is the way to go. If you're just getting into carp fishing or you're confused about rigs, I've tied a rig up perfect for you. 
First of all, we've got a flying back lid on the line, and believe it or not, that goes on last because you can take it on and off the line as you need to use it. But if you're just getting into carp fishing, I'd recommend you get into using them because when you cast out, they fly back up the line, pin the last bit down by the bottom, so there's no way the fish can come into contact with the line. And just above that, I've got a little tiny 4mm rubber bead that comes in the packaging with the safe zone flying back leads. That goes on before the tubing and that stops the flying back lead sliding down the tubing and ending up next to the lead before you cast out. Because if the two are sitting next to each other, they won't separate in flight. Then I've got about 18 inches, 45 centimetres approximately of rig tubing. I've cut the main line to a point with a pair of scissors to make it easy to thread it. Never bite it and try and thread it through. And then the end of the tubing I've also cut to a point which makes it easy to push into that rubber connector. Now a fatal mistake people make with these is they glue them at this point. And then when it's hitting the lake bed and it's in your bag and everything, it's working backwards and forwards, the glue makes it brittle and eventually it snaps off. You don't need to glue it because there's nothing to pull that out during the cast. And then the rubber connectors push nicely onto the end of the hard insert that comes out of the inline lead. I've cut that hard insert down a little bit so it all butts up nice and neat so there's nothing for the hook link to catch on. And that's the beauty of all of our systems. You go from the tubing onto the rubber and then onto the lead system with no lip, no edges for the hook link to catch on. And that's what's going to stop the rig tangling. It's a two ounce square pair inline lead that will cast as far as you need to when you start in your fishing. And I've got a size eight ring swivel pulled into the nose of the lead. There's a special hard insert that goes right through the middle and it's just big enough at the front to pull that swivel into. So you simply can't do it wrong. I've got a 12 pound IQ soft hook link, but to be honest, you could use a line on the reel. 10 or 12 pound line straight off the reel would do exactly the same job. And what you want to be spending your money on when you first get into rigs is hooks. Make sure you're changing your hook all the time because a sharp hook is going to get you more bites than anything else. This is a size eight wide gape. It's my favorite one in the whole range. Obviously, if your barbarous rules apply, you want a wide gape B. And I've just tied a loop for my hair then threaded on a little tiny bit of our 0.5 silicon tubing and that basically holds the hair up the hook so it's leaving the hook somewhere near the bend and what that does is it makes the point of the hook heavy and it will turn and catch hold when it goes in the fish's mouth. It's tied on with a knotless knot which is really really easy to tie and the addition I've made to this one after fishing with Adam Penning is I've done a single turn around the knot when I'm going back down before I go through the eye just to lock everything in place so the lock so the knot, sorry, can't expand and contract while you're playing a fish. And that's what makes hook links like this snap, is that knot expanding and contracting. Doing that bit around the outside stops that happening. It's probably six inches long, 15 centimetres. This is to be used on a hard bottom, so there's no weed around. If there was weed, I'd extend it a little bit. And I've got one of the 12 mil dumbbells on there, one of the new mainline dumbbells. And I'd couple that with a nice PVA bag, which I'm going to hook on now for you. There we go. Little tiny funnel web bag. Anything more than that is a waste. I've looped to loop the hook link onto that size 8 ring swivel so I can unloop it if I want to take it off or just loop another one straight on again if I want to cut it. And that's basically it. An inline rig that you could fish anywhere. Really, really easy to use. No super glue required. Only a few components and that will catch fish on any water. Come on, yes, got him. Oh, a relief. That was a battle and a half. Well, that is all we've got time for in this installment of Carp Tackle Tactics and Tips. We hope you've got loads of information for making the right purchases on the kit to suit your own fishing. And we hope you've got some fish catching tips as well to put a few more of these beasts on the bank. Thanks to Nick, Chris and all the team at Maison for their kind hospitality on this fantastic venue. And if you want details of anything you've seen in here, it's gonna be shown at the end of the film with email addresses and where to get in contact with them. What a beast. Thank you, my love. See you next year. <laughs>